takes control over all the key state institutions, like the media. Have you noticed that the first thing the dictator goes after is the media? That's the first thing, to shut it down and control it. That's what Chavez did in Venezuela. Many of these cities, the first thing they do is go after the media. Why? Because the media disseminates information. And Stalin once said that control the flow of information and you control the minds of the people. That's why all, media, all dictators want to control the media. And of course, if you want to fight the media, the media, if you want to fight dictators, the media is the first institution that you should go and get them press of control out of the hands of that dictatorship. And then, the security forces, they go after the security forces. And then they go after the judiciary and part those institutions with their, what? Supporters, loyal uh, supporters, cronies, friends, and, and so forth. So even if when the dictator is not there, okay, his supporters and cronies are still in those institutions. And those institutions need to be dewormed. Okay? Now, that second step in a revolution is often not carried out, or often it is botched. Now, when it is botched, guess what happens? What happens is that it, has, it, it allows the dictator, it, I'm sorry, it allows remnants of the dictator to claw themselves back to power. This is exactly what has happened in Egypt, where the revolution has completely been re uh, reversed. General, you know, Field Marshal Al-Sisi, all the generals, the military generals, they were all Mugabe, uh, I'm sorry, Mubarak appointees. The judges, they were Mubarak appointees. They are not back, in, you know, in Egypt, they call them the Felulas. They are back in charge. So the revolution has completely been reversed. It's the same thing in Tunisia. So it's actually critically important. You see, in Eastern Europe, <clears throat> the remnants of the old regime, they are called the nomenclatura. It is important to clean up and dismantle that dictatorship in order to have a free and uh, a free and fair society. Now, we had Africa's own village revolutions. We had in the 1991 to 1994. We had similar occurrences. Now, the African people, you know, after the year. Uh, you know, this is what happened in Africa in um, the, uh, <clears throat> after independence. <clears throat> African leaders said, you know, <clears throat> democracy is a Western institution, so we don't want to have anything to do with it. It's a Western institution. And we don't want to have anything to do with capitalism. Why? Because colonialism was evil, and because the colonialists said they were capitalists, as they were capitalists, aha, it meant that capitalism too was evil and exploitative. So we didn't want to have anything to do with it. So we prefer socialism. And um, guess what kind of socialism they practice? The type of socialism they practice was a peculiar form of Swiss bank socialism, <laughs> which allowed African leaders in their cronies to uh, rape and plunder Africa's uh, uh, treasury for deposit in Switzerland. I mean, it's uh, Robert Mugabe's uh, cabinet was asked to define socialism, and he said, here yeah, in Zimbabwe, socialism means what is mine is mine. But what is yours, we share. <laughs> now, <clears throat> after the collapse of the Soviet Union in uh, uh, 1989, African dictators all of a sudden found themselves without any clothes. So the people of Africa rose up in village revolutions, you know, and winds of change swept across uh, the continent. But you see, <clears throat> let me give you an analogy. It's like, you know, you have a bad driver and a bad vehicle. Now that wave of revolutions, what they did is only change the driver, it didn't fix the vehicle. In other words, if a vehicle doesn't have any brakes, it doesn't matter whether you're a good driver or a bad driver, you still end up in a ditch. 
which is exactly what happened. In other words, when you get rid of the dictator, you must also fix the vehicle. And to fix the vehicle, you have to dismantle you know, the dictatorship itself, fix the dictatorship itself. Now, <clears throat> the reason why I brought this analogy is because <clears throat> if you want to fix a vehicle, you have to fix a vehicle in a certain order. You don't put a brand new carburetor on, a, on an old engine when the battery is dead. You, you fix the electrical system first before you put the carburetor on. In exactly the same way, when you want to dismantle a dictatorship, you have to do that in sequence. The dictatorship needs to be dismantled, needs reform in so many areas. It needs intellectual reform. It needs political reform. It needs constitutional reform. It needs institutional reform. And it needs economic reform. And I ask you, which type of reform should come first? Should we have intellectual reform first? Should we reform the, uh, the constitution first? Should we reform the political system first? We have to have this one clear idea. In the past, what we did, or what the IMF and the World Bank did, was to say that, all right, look, economic reform, economic freedom is more important. So <clears throat> they started out with economic reform. Now, the problem here is that, you know, if you ask dictators to reform their economies, they will only implement the type of reforms that benefits them and their families, which is why Mokosne Obari, he practiced economic reform, implemented economic reform, but then he amassed a personal fortune of 42 billion, likely for his family. That was not real economic reform. Economic reform, which, you know, and that resulted in crony capitalism. Okay. Now, again, think about this. I believe that if you want to restart really reform in a free society, you need to start with intellectual reform, freedom of expression, the free media. See, information is very, very powerful. Information is power. That's where you start. And that's how you empower the people so that you know, if you want change, change has to come from within. Remember. <laughs> think about this. Think about the former Soviet Union. What triggered the uh, collapse of the former Soviet Union? Look at what Gorbachev said. He said, glass news. What does glass news mean? Openness. Freedom of the expression, freedom of the mind. And also notice what, you know, the role that the West played there. The, what did the West do? The West established Radio Free Europe. Now think of this again. Radio Free Europe, think of what Radio Free Africa would do. Radio Free Africa would do for Africa what Radio Free Europe did to the former Soviet Union. That's what I told Hillary Clinton when she was Secretary of State. It is quite important. Once you have intellectual freedom, but you see, we're not promoting that. The World Bank is not promoting that. The IMF is not promoting that. Western governments are not promoting that. I'll tell you this. If you want to help Africa, the first thing that you do is to get and get and get the media out of the hands of corrupt and incompetent governments in Africa. Thank you so much. that they might want to ask. Yes.
Hi, um, I had a question. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, my name is Tim Jacobs. I go to the University of Maryland. Um, and I wanted to know, you said you saw a similar, um, you saw how uh, Africans rejected capitalism, um, African leaders, the dictators rejected <laughs> capitalism in Africa. Um, do you see the same exact parallel here in the United States where you see some African American leaders who are rejecting capitalism in areas that could obviously use the growth um, and scapegoating it for the causes of slavery? Do you see that parallel as well? That, uh, do I see the parallel where? Um, do you see the parallel here in the United States where there are some African-American leaders in low-income areas who tend to <laughs> denounce capitalism in the same way as the African leaders um, do? Do you see that parallel? Um, oh, yeah. Um, I think um, it would be fair to say that African-Americans are uh, 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 suspicious about capitalism. Because they, they believe that the capitalism of the old really hurt them and sort of exploited them. So uh, they are quite suspicious of capitalism. Yes. <coughs> I think there's somebody here. Could you share some of your observations about how reform went down in um, South Africa? how you think that was handled, what you think about the result, and um, Mandela in particular? Uh, do I what? share your observations about the reform in South Africa after apartheid came down? I don't think it was clear. I I, I, do I share what? My Could you share some of your observations about reform in South Africa <laughs> after Mandela? OK. Um, <clears throat> I think, you know, uh, Mandela was one of the um, <clears throat> uh, great leaders of Africa. The reason why I'm saying this was because Mandela governed like an African chief. He governed like an African because, uh, number one, <clears throat> he believed in reconciliation. He believed in reaching out <coughs> uh, to the others. <coughs> But um, <coughs> but um, the ANC uh, right now has been a disappointment. Zuma has been a disappointment. I think what you're seeing uh, South Africa in terms of uh, you know Zuma is more of an arrogance of power and. Um, <coughs> Zuma hasn't provided the leadership that, but there's a huge difference between Zuma and Mandela. <coughs> That's my candid observation. <coughs> Excuse me. Any other questions? <coughs> I'm James from Ohio University. How big of a role do you think uh, material property rights play in uh, oppression in Africa? What sort of uh, property rights? Material property rights. <laughs> in in uh, play in what? Africa in general? Yes. <laughs> wow, that's that's a huge question. Right? <laughs> <laughs> You have to limit the question in terms of, you know, <coughs> um, <coughs> my cold is coming back again. <coughs> I think um, the greatest uh, threat to property rights in Africa has come from governments. Governments which can, you know, seize property does not recognize individual ownership of property. As a matter of fact, <coughs> in many parts of Africa, unoccupied land is, you know, land is, belongs to the state. Now again, and this is a foreign concept which was, you know, um, in 
imported into Africa by various you know, ideological African uh, leaders. In Ethiopia, all land belongs to the state. In Nigeria, all land belongs to the state. And you cannot you know, have a farm in Nigeria without going through securing you know, government permission to own the land. And the same thing in Angola as well, as Mozambique. You know, this sort of you know, um, restrictions it's also part of the reasons which is holding Africa back. Because, you know, <clears throat> when you have so much government control, now again, remember this. In our own traditional system, remember that Africa had its own traditional system before the colonialists came. But you see, the type of system which was imposed upon Africa by its own elites or leaders is <laughs> totally alien. And it's also part of the reasons why Africa is you know, in the economic backwater. My name is James Mayer, <laughs> Ivy Tech Community College of Indiana. Okay. And my question for you oh, um, is uh, about, you're talking about how you have the security institutions for dictatorships to fall. For instance, with the army, how do you keep that from becoming a coup? How do you keep what? Uh, you know, you said securing the institutions like in Egypt they did with the army. Uh, how do you keep that from becoming a coup? You know, in that they wouldn't fire on a people and what you have now was the military and the security forces overthrowing the Muslim Brotherhood. You know, it's... Um, it's... This is a very dicey question, and it's also something that we have to wrestle with. Okay. Because uh, the West or the U.S. tend to have, um, tend to place a lot of faith on strong men. You know, because, because the West is fighting against terrorism, there's always some kind of, you know, fondness for strong men. You know, the West tends to think that, you know, Strong men can effectively deal with, you know, terrorists. But the West should think again. The military has been the scourge of Africa, the bane of its development. I mean, if you look across Africa, look at all the collapsed states in Africa, all the collapsed states in Africa have been ruined by military generals. Start with uh, Liberia, 1990, was ruined by General Samuel Do. Go to Somalia, 1991, General Siad Bari. Rwanda, 1994, General Juvenile Habriamana. Burundi, General Pierre Bioya. Zaire, General Mobutu Sosaseiko. Sierra Leone, General Joseph Moy, Momo. Ivory Coast. General Robert D. I can name them. Military dictators have left a trail of collapsed seats in Africa. Now, <clears throat> the thing is, <clears throat> when you see in Egypt, General Abdel Al Sisi expressing a desire to become the president of Egypt, and then there's something wrong. Because you see, look, <clears throat> wherever the military uh, manages a transition to democracy, it has always been a disaster. Nigeria is one particular case. See, back in 1993, General Ibrahim Babangida tried to shepherd Nigeria through a democratic uh, process. Guess what he did? He says, the U.S. has only two political systems, so he created exactly two political systems for Nigeria. And get this, he even wrote the, the party manifestos himself. The next one to take over the management of uh, transition to democracy was General, was General Sani Abacha. Eventually, he allowed only five political parties to exist in Nigeria in 1997. And guess what? All those political parties adopted him as their presidential candidate. Everywhere, 
where the military has managed. Look at Burma. Burma transitioned to democracy. The military in Burma established its own political party and also said that even before the elections, the military declared that it had already won the elections. Come on. Now, the military is a colonial institution. Now, if you look at the debts that the military has caused, now let me give you a rundown of this. The number of people which have died in Africa since 1960 totals something like 20.9 million people. Okay? The war in uh, uh, Congo has caused something like 6.4 million people. The war in Sudan, more than 4 million people. If you add all that up, it comes to 20.9 million. The military is responsible for all this. See, the function of the military you know, is to defend the territorial integrity of the country. <clears throat> but in Africa, the military is at war with the people. It's supposed to defend. <coughs> 20.9 million people have died. Now, historians tell us that during the slave trade, Africa lost 10 million people from the West African slave trade and another 10 million from the East African slave trade run by the Arabs and also across the uh, Sahara. So which means that in the space of just 50 years, more people have died. Uh, but the same people have died. Then Africa lost through the slave trade from the West Coast, East Coast, and across the Sahara. It's very, very disturbing, all because of the military. This is why I say that the military has been the pain of Africa's development. And, you know, in traditional Africa, you know, the few of the uh, 22,000 African ethnic groups had standing armies. Very, very few of them. In fact, in traditional Africa, the people were the army. In the case of hostilities, you know, the chief will assemble the uh, young men of a certain age group to work, fight war. After that, you know, the, the people's army was disbanded. The military has become a dream on Africa's economy. So, you see, the general in Egypt should never, never, never be encouraged to run for president. Because once the military, once the military man wins an election, that's it. They win all subsequent elections. Look at Mubarak. Look at Ben Ali. Ben Ali, a military officer. Uh, Mubarak, a military officer. They won all subsequent elections. So developments in Egypt do not bode very well at all. <coughs> yes. Well, I compare what? North Korea? North Korea and various countries. <laughs> My name is Lawrence Scott from the University of Hawaii, and I wanted to know how you would compare uh, various African countries with a government like North Korea, because I think we're more <laughs> familiar with that just in general. I think? Um. <coughs> I can't believe that nobody yeah. has to <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> The African country that comes closest to uh, being the North Korea of Africa is Eritrea, uh, where you have brutal repression. Almost all the journalists, you know, in Eritrea are punished. But even then, you know, <laughs> it's very, very difficult to establish something like a North Korea in Africa. Why? Because, you know, borders in Africa are porous. And traditionally, Africans, if they don't, if Africans don't want, you know, to be oppressed, they'll simply vote with their feet to go and settle somewhere else. And they'll simply, you know, uh, float through the borders and go and settle somewhere else. So, uh, anybody who attempts to accept, you know, a North Korea in Africa will find that the, the people are gone. Which is why, you know, Eritrea is having so much trouble. And when people escape, you know, they become both people. And I'm sure you've heard about the recent cases of, you know, 
people drowning along the case of you know Italian coast uh, islands because most of most of them are, Ethi are Ethiopians and Eritreans who are escaping an oppression. Okay. Yeah, time for one more. Hi, my name is Sarah Harvard, and I go to American University. Um, <laughs> So the question about foreign aid, and a lot of times foreign aid has been used as a tool for national security and national relief um, and development and democracy, but in cases in Haiti and Egypt, um, that's been counterproductive. So I, would, I was wondering if you could give me some insight on why foreign aid is counterproductive. Um, you're asking about foreign aid? Okay. Um, and whether foreign aid would be helpful in uh, establishing democracy, say, in Egypt and Africa? Oh, it's already counterproductive. You know, we all know that. <laughs> but I think, you know, uh, <clears throat> I always say that Africa's begging bowl leaks. You know, it's... Uh, it's like you have a bowl, and the total amount of foreign aid that comes into Africa is about 30 billion, 3 billion. But then, you know, corruption alone costs Africa $148 billion a year. And that's something which flows out, okay? And then, you know, if you measure out of the leakages that we have in Africa, we have, you know, Corruption, we have, we, we spend so much money on arms, weapons. We spend something like $20 billion a year on important weapons. The weapons and ammunition for what? You know, to kill ourselves in Africa. And then, you know, we spend something like $25 billion importing food. See, back in the 1960s, Africa not only fed itself, it also exported food. Why can't Africa feed itself? It can't feed itself because of disastrous and misguided government policies that discriminate against you know, poor farmers. Now, then we have capital flight. Capital flight out of Africa costs something like $80 billion a year. So, um, we're getting all this aid, but nobody knows you know, what the aid really does you know, in, you know, in Africa. And it simply flows into the pockets of corrupt politicians. Right now, in Malawi, there is something called Cash Gate. It was discovered that $100 billion had been squandered and embezzled by senior government officials, so they are started in investigations. Now, that's what they always say, you know. Now, <clears throat> when that happens, the donors say, okay, we're going to suspend aid until they do a thorough investigation, and guess what they do? They set up an anti-corruption committee to investigate. But then, you know, when the anti-corruptions are snitched too close to the fat guards, and pam, they shut it down. This is a case in, uh, it happened in 2000, in January 2006, when President Bush decided to go to uh, Tanzania for a visit. They set up an anti-corruption committee to investigate corruption in Tanzania. But then the anti-corruption czar himself was implicated in a corruption scandal. <laughs> Look, they set up these coconut commissions that go nowhere. Like the right expertise. Okay? They are not serious about solving corruption. And then, you know, uh, what did the Western donors do? Well, they scratched their head. Well, okay, well, all right. You know, you can't expect everything to be uh, perfect in Africa. And then they resume aid. It's the same macabre ritual that they go through again and again and again. You know, it's not effective. But then, you see, look, <clears throat> we need to be serious about Africa. And you, the young, our generation, we fail Africa. And it is you, the young, which needs to drive some sense and sanity into all those do-gooders who want to help the African people. And it's about time that we told them enough. The African people can help themselves. Thank you so much.
versus Woof. And there's